Thank you, Kelly. Thanks, Kelly, very much. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Mark Luba, and we're here to talk about the what and why of the next versions of Open Badges and the Comprehensive Learner Record. And I have to give a lot of credit, of course, to Kelly for organizing this session, especially her ability to bring together the, the leading practitioners uh, on this subject. And we're really happy to be joined by three of the leaders that are in the center of, of what's happening with Open Badges and, and the CLR. Uh, first, let me introduce Brent Capriati, Senior Consultant and of Operational Strategy at Western Governors University. Marty Reed, Chief Executive Officer for Randa Solutions. And Dr. Timothy Summers, the Executive Director of Product Development, Digital Trust at Arizona State University. So thanks each of you for joining us today and pulling time away from your busy schedule to talk with us about the next generation of open badges and CLR. So uh, those of you that are following the this quote unquote market are well aware that there is lots going on on the topic of micro-credentials, learning and employment records. And, and um, so thanks for stopping in and, and um, getting a little bit of background on what is going on. Uh, before we start, I'd like to ask you, Brent, if you don't mind, uh, you know, we're talking about the next version of Open Badges and the Comprehensive Learner Record. Talk, talk to us about the current version. What, what exactly is Open Badges? What, what are Comprehensive Learner Records? What are they all about? Hi, everyone. Brent Capriati from WGU, and thank you, Mark. Um, open badges and comprehensive learner record in, in my simple mind are really ways of um, representing achievements either individually or in aggregate and having a way to uh, interoperable consistent standards based way to publish those and for consuming systems that actually receive things like digital credentials to have a consistent format that's flowing in that they can react to so um, the current version of open badges and the current version of comprehensive learner record at least directionally fit that. And I think the scope of an open badge is typically tied to um, a, you know, I guess you would call it an individual assertion of an achievement, but an achievement can be many achievements. For example, a WGU open badge that we issue might be tied to a certificate level achievement that is based on the completion of three courses. So that's, there is some aggregate value to that, but an open badge is one assertion not to get too technical because I can't. Um, and then also comprehensive learner record, uh, then uh, CLR 1.0 that we have right now is a way to represent um, achievements and assert them in aggregate via one record that is published. So for example, if a student finishes a degree, there might be many sub achievements that underlie that degree, courses, micro credentials, there could be competencies and skills. So a comprehensive learner record, even in its current state, gives us the ability to uh, make those assertions in aggregate in ways that can be received by consuming systems and meaning can be made of them to hopefully match talent with opportunity. Thanks, Brent. You know, the term micro-credential is frequently used now and curious about the difference, if anything, between micro-credential and the open badge or digital badge. It's a good question. Um, and I think the response to this might um, vary institution to institution, but from WGU's perspective, an open badge, again, is a digital representation of an achievement, and that could fall anywhere on what we call our unified credential framework which is a framework of achievements that WGU has choose to issue open badges for at different levels. So they go competency, uh, specialization, certificate and certification. So those micro credentials, as you could tell, are all sub degree, that, that's how we're viewing them. And we are applying them and asserting them selectively as opposed to an aggregate. We don't issue open badges for absolutely everything out there. So um, micro credentials, I guess, categorically, the way that I view them is um, achievements that are particularly market relevant that tend to fall 
below the degree level, but could, of course, be cobbled into degrees and baked into degrees so that students can potentially take micro-credential level offerings and then have on-ramps into um, longer form programs. Our, and I guess from an open badges perspective, again, I think of that as a visual digital representation in, of an achievement that has a data specification that underlies it that allows us to publish and consume these things consistently. So it's very reasonable to think that you might want to issue open badges for micro-credentials, which is what WGU does. I see. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, that also brings to mind the, the terminology, uh, which we're hearing a lot of now, learning and employment records, L-E-R. Um, and sometimes people are asking us, uh, you know, for a copy of the L-E-R standard, or, uh, you know, is that a competing standard? No. <laughs> As I see it, they're, they're complementary, they're congruent. And uh, I think of a learning and employment record as uh, one of many places in an ecosystem that is forming. Not that there's going to just be one learning and employment record that everyone uses, but there will be many interfaces, maybe uh, state specific, maybe industry specific, maybe industries within states. Um, so uh, a learning and employment record just at its my most basic understanding of what one is, is a way for a learner work, worker to have their achievements, whether verifiable from an issuer or self-asserted tied to their education and or work achievements represented and manageable in an achievement wallet, which would, which would typically be their interface and allows them to manage, make public, curate and share those achievements and credentials and the competencies and skills that they've gained along the way in order to um, best represent themselves and further their career. So I think of a learning and employment record as like the abstract layer of um, what is actually used, the technology product, and a comprehensive learner record as a way to actually, um, in an interoperable way, assert achievements into that that could represent any variety of achievements, not just higher ed achievements. Great, thank you. Tim, um, Brent mentioned verifiable credential. Um, what, what is, and we've heard that of course, and, and we're, you and the rest of the team are very uh, aware of and involved with verifiable credentials. Could you describe what they are? Sure, and thanks for having me. Um, you know, verifiable credentials are digital representations of real-world credentials, uh, just like government-issued IDs, passports, driver's licenses, birth certificates, educational degrees. And you know, in the past, these credentials have been stored in physical form, making them susceptible to fraud, loss, all kinds of other things. And however, now with the advent of some new technology we have, we can now store them electronically using cryptographic techniques to ensure their authenticity. This makes it you know, possible to verify the credentials without revealing sensitive information, such as your social security number, for example. And as a result, verifiable credentials are becoming increasingly important in the digital world. Uh, verifiable credentials, or VCs as we call them, have the potential of becoming increasingly important here. Uh, they have the potential to transform the way that we demonstrate our identity and qualifications online making it easier uh, to verify someone's credentials without even needing to know them personally. This is a huge advancement. And, and they also have the potential to improve security, uh, maybe making it a little harder for malicious actors to forge those credentials that maybe you've worked so hard for. So um, for the last 15 months or so, I can report that the uh, CLR and Open Badges work group have been aligning the, their work with the W3C's uh, recently published verifiable credential standard so that the CLR 2.0 and Open Badges 3.0 are in fact what are called native verifiable credentials, which is, is fantastic as it, uh, they align with the, the, the vision that you were describing and, and the digital wallets that have been discussed as well. Uh, so, so that's uh, really great news. It's, uh, it's been done over the course of the last year or so, and uh, we're starting already to see solutions um, coming to market that are supporting this newer version. As a matter of fact, we have uh, Marty on the, on the uh, panel today, who himself is in the middle of uh, rolling out their solution at Randa. 
what can you tell us, Marty, about what you're seeing in the marketplace about available solutions? So I can say, um, and thanks for thanks for having me today. Uh, that there's a lot of, of of different solutions across the marketplace. So right now in production, you know, things just around verifiable credentials, age verification, supply chain, you know, the SVI project by a Department of Homeland Security. So, so there's definitely some kind of very high level, very, very simple verifiable credentials. Am I over 18? Did this product come from Mexico? Uh, you know, those types of things. But what we're seeing now is those, those strategies maturing into real world application, such as a teacher license. Do you have a transcript? Does that include an endorsement from the university for three through eight education? Do you have a, a badge around school leadership? Can you present all of that to me in a verifiable way? So, so uh, and, and even with the K-12 approach, of, you know, uh, statewide transcript solutions, delivering those verifiable credentials to employers. What we're seeing is that CLR, Open Badge, LER, all of this, work coming together because it has to. In order to solve real world problems, you can't just say, are you over 18? That's a very, very uh, small use case, uh, widely used, but for the types of credentials that lead to employment, they're more complex. And so you see spokes like Smart Resume, uh, you know, building uh, digital resumes. Um, you see Territorium doing some really cool stuff with the CLR. And so, so we're seeing a lot of, uh, a lot of different approaches not only from you know age verification, kind of supply chain management, but also transcripts, licenses, endorsements. Um, you know the complexity is is occurring, and CLR and OB together kind of facilitate that. So open badges originally um, came to market, I guess, in 2014, 2015, uh, in the CLR emerged initially in uh, late 2018, early 2019. And there was quite a long time when people were saying, well, you know, what is this? And how would one think about should issuing open badges ver versus issuing CLR as if it was um, you know, a binary decision? Um, what, what can you say about uh, everyone? What can you say about of the way that open badges and the CLR kind of both work together in terms of, of credentials for achievements. So I'll speak to our implementation, our open source implementation with North Dakota, um, because it uses both. And so what we saw slowly but surely was an open badge is actually just an individual assertion of achievement inside a CLR. So it's very easy, very straightforward to kind of put that open badge in a CLR, that CLR is a VC, that open badge is a VC, both together and independently. Um, and so, so you can kind of build on a level of complexity. If you're going to build out a pathway, for ex example, you want to have progress on that pathway. You want to interact with CTDL, um, you know, those types of interactions, all of that kind of has to be facilitated with the combination of the two. Open badge says, I achieved this thing. CLR says, I achieved these things. Here's how they connect to each other. You mentioned CTDL. Um, help us there with that. So you have the Credential Engine uh, project that is you know, nationwide building a database of kind of credential definitions. And so being able to embed that uh, mapping directly into the assertion, directly into the assertion of a of an open badge or, or in an assertion in a CLR gives you kind of rich data connection outside of that individual, uh, that individual credential. Very good. Okay. Thank you. And Mark, um, yes. I'm, this one's, this question is really close to my heart actually, because um, uh, of the idea of using open badges and comprehensive learner record and even other types of uh, achievements or credentials and thoughtful combination, um, not just because of the, I guess, the curve or the arc of adoption for an institution maybe to get started with what is the easier lift at this point, which is open badges, and then in time uh, solving to either engineer or adopt a comprehensive learner publishing tool that works in a very complementary way. And the way that 
I, I really wrap my head around the, the reason for why that would be necessary or a thoughtful thing to do for learners is at WGU, again, for certain levels of micro targeted levels of micro credentials, we are issuing open badges. They're issued immediately after they're earned, whereas a comprehensive learner record is something that might be more periodically published uh, and certainly published, let's say, for example, at the end of a degree completion for a full manifest of somebody's achievements. But the idea that we can use these data standards or specifications in combination in order to uh, I guess you'd say fill up students' achievement wallets, whatever their interfaces are to share these things with timely relevant achievements that help them move their careers and educations incrementally. But we don't wanna stop there at least at WGU because then what you have is a subset of the learner's achievements and their competencies and skills represented in their wallet as opposed to the big picture. So using them in thoughtful combination allows you to issue open badges in a very targeted, uh, selective market relevant way, but then fall back on the comprehensive learner record being published and consumed at regular intervals. So the achievement wallet tells a full story of what a student's capabilities are and lets them put their best foot forward. So that that's how I see them being used together. Whether or not those achievements were individually batched, they can be incorporated into the comprehensive learner record and the what therefore, you know, the digital wallet. Yeah. This, it, this, exactly. this, one, this one touches on something close to me too, Brett. So I'm so glad you, you opened this door. Thank you. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's so interesting. I love talking about open badges. And really, to me, this is like a verifiable credential issued by an authoritative source, right? I can, I can you know, this credential can essentially indicate all kind of really unique things about me. The open badges then can be stored in the comprehensive learner record, right? I mean, this allows a learner to easily share this stuff, um, making it, you know, sharing their credentials with others, making it an easy way for employers to verify their qualifications. And having the open badges and the CLR working together provides a more complete picture for the learner skills and accomplishments. And, and the technology is amazing. But the thing I always really, you know, remind myself of and I want to remind us of is just the power here, the verifiable credentials are so important because they provide this massive and amazing means, right, for verifying an individual's skills, qualifications, experience, and all this other stuff that's really amazing. But for, if you look at that at a holistic perspective, there is such a social justice application here, providing a way for people to document their skills and their accomplishments and, and, and being able to utilize that for new opportunities. It's just that so I, I got really excited. It's my passion talking. <laughs> well, I mean, that's a really important point that sometimes people um, aren't aware of, Tim Timothy, and that is the ability for these records to capture self-assertions where you or I or others can claim their skill and provide evidence of that, you know, a video or the work product or the, the item that they may have created or, or uh, just, you know, performed. And, and incorporate that in with this bundle of achievements that they've received from many other institutions into what we're thinking of as a more modern day, but verifiable resume. And uh, as a matter of fact, you know, we're working very closely with the HR open standards body to uh, move that work forward so that in fact, these digital wallets can still use the metaphor of resume and have all the other qualities of that and yet incorporate in those resumes these verifiable achievements that themselves have this extra power, whether they're issued by a formal institution or a community-based program or the individual themselves. And uh, so I'm like you, I share your enthusiasm about the power of that particular aspect of this. But institutions, you know, still are extremely important when it comes to helping to move the market, not only for, in order to do the initial adoption of these verifiable credentials, but now here we're, we've updated the version. So now you have a, a little bit of an extra complexity in a way is that the market providers will need to be able to themselves get updated to incorporate some of the new capabilities. And so that's going to really require institutions to play a critical role to help move the market, to help move that 
uh, group of, so of providers, software tech providers, to put pressure on them effectively. Would you, would you agree with that, Timothy and, and Brent? You know, I absolutely agree with that. I, I think, you know, there's a lot of ways institutions can, can move the market. I think one way that institutions can move the market is by supporting the development of an ecosystem of providers and consumers of verifiable credentials. I think this ecosystem could provide the resources and community support needed to create and maintain a, a robust uh, environment. Um, in addition, I think institutions can help by developing and assisting in the development of standards, uh, like, for example, what we're doing uh, with VCs, for example, a lot of us are in a lot of those conversations. Um, these standards can help then ensure that you know, we've got the right kind of accuracy and trustworthiness we need. Um, but then also, you know, let's not even, Let's not even it would be remiss not to mention the courage money or courage capital that I think is necessary um, to make VCs, uh, you know, something that everyone is, is able to use uh, to ensure that there's enough support out there where, you know, organizations can affordably and accessibly get, you know, get into this ecosystem. And, and, I, and I think that by taking those kinds of steps, uh, institutions could really help develop a market and develop a really thriving and robust marketplace. Yeah, right. from, from my perspective, I, I, I think this is about walking the walk, um, whether you are adopting tools, whether you're engaging vendors, whether you are getting into contracts with uh, development teams to uh, do things like uh, create comprehensive learner record, uh, publishing services and things of that nature is to really represent the the innovation behind the data standards and to to level up um at a reasonable pace uh same thing holds true for digital credentialing open badges uh uh off the shelf type uh tools that a lot of folks are using right now and then the other thing is consuming tools and really i think trying to influence consuming tools like learner records achievement wallets things of that nature to support the new versions of the standards but also understand that there are going to be legacy versions of these credentials floating out there because that is what was issued over the last 10 years. So ultimately, the game changes for consuming tools and that they need to be able to react to differing recipes for the same type of digital credential, like let's say Open Badges 2 versus Open Badges 3. There's one other thing, Mark. Uh, interoperability uh, is critical for all of this. Um, in order for this to be the kind of transformative technology that we all see it potentially being, um, it, it, in order for this to happen, there has to be a flow smoothly between different systems, different organizations, and that requires a lot more than just the technical operability, but also that interoperability at the organizational level, and we all know how challenging that can be for institutions. I really think that that's another place where they can really help us move the market um, and it, even potentially be market makers around that because they, we all need to be able to share this verifiable credential information um, at a multitude of levels in order for this ecosystem we're trying to grow to even exist. Um, I think that's one other place where they can substantially help as well. Right, we, we think of that as rightly or wrongly as semantic interoperability. And uh, you may know that we're working of course very closely with the American Association of Collegiate Registrars and Admissions Officers, ACRO. And they, and, and with our assistance has created implementation guides which are intended on trying to help uh, institutions develop that uh, common foundational uh, uh, approach towards these new ways of, of capturing achievements, academic, uh, co-curricular, skills-based achievements. And uh, it's, it's going to be a long road uh, before it's um, well understood uh, uh, what each of these publishing organizations, as we might call them, uh, um, how, how their programs are, are designed and incorporating that institutional knowledge really into uh, the entire ecosystem. So uh, it is going to be um, an, an important aspect, as you said, uh, but I'm, I'm optimistic that by working with, you know, the organization that registrars look to for their guidance and for their uh, policies and procedures that you know, we, we uh, have taken a, a good first step. So I have, a, not to derail, but I have a quick question for Timothy and Brent. From an institution standpoint, how do you guys think about porting the trust 
that is already placed in your credentials that you already issue into this verifiable credential world. How do you guys, how do you guys think about that? It's a good question. Um, it, it's it's uh, something that uh, I certainly, I, I certainly assume because of the, the rigor and uh, care that goes into the actual design and creation of these credentials and the way that they are constructed and you'd call it the credential integrity and underlying assessment integrity that's tied to them, understanding full well that when they are consumed by these systems and meaning is made of them, at least in my mind, it's not just about the digital credential then anymore. It's more so about what was inside. The credentials are the boxes that deliver the goods. The descriptive metadata inside, especially the skill alignments are the key for me. So as long as I know on our side of the fence, the digital credentials that WGU is creating and issuing to our students are um, something that I can certainly trust and be proud of. And as long as we engage with consuming systems that um, do uh, above board thoughtful things with those credentials when they are actually consumed and those students are represented fairly and accurately, whether or not the metadata inside the credential is disaggregated and used for different reasons like matching skills and things of that nature. That's great. That's just leveraging the power of what's inside. So I, I have less concern around that as long as from an in institutional perspective, we partner with consuming systems and uh, we establish bi-directional trust that way. I, uh, well, I think that uh, Brent hit on a couple of really important topics. Uh, the bi-directional trust is really important as well. Um, we also have been establishing an ecosystem of partners there, but I think there's really three things that I've seen ASU doing, um, and I and I really have to, uh, you know, give the university some credit in terms of some of this forward thinking. There's really three pieces, three challenges that you know we've been sort of addressing there. And when I say we, I don't necessarily just mean the pocket team, but I mean other teams at ASU as well, um, thinking locally, right? Acting locally, thinking globally. But three challenges, one being that, you know, lack of clarity around how the sort of existing credits, right, can move around, you know, things around equivalency, things around, you know, curriculum mapping. So at ASU right now, we actually have three different tools that are being developed in that space, but one of which that I think of is, is incredibly important at the core of this is the triangulation uh, across uh, the things that, uh, the experiences that you might've gained or the courses you might've taken. At the end of the day, as Brent uh, mentioned, it all boils down to what's actually inside of the BC, but we really think that there's gonna be a lot of important information that institutions will be able and, and be primely uh, able to develop or create or even assisting gleaning insights from so that we can actually do this appropriate triangulation, whatever that means. At ASU right now, what that means is we're building a tool around our transfer guide. And, and we're talking about a database of over millions of equivalency rules. So I think that that's a really big part of that. Um, but there's a lot of other pieces to it. There's a lot of other tools and resources that need to be brought to bear uh, in order for us to really, really see this thing deliver fruit. But great question, Marty. And I think, I think that we're all really touching on multiple parts of this. And I think with all of our perspectives, you know, that really is what's going to bring us to a point where we get a comprehensive way of solution finding. Well, in triangulation, I mean, to me, brings to mind the use of the standard, which is CASE, uh, the Competency and Academic Standards Exchange, which is a way to, um, to basically tag each of your achievements such that they can be retrieved from a common framework, uh, published either by the institution or published by some other organization of authority. And so CASE is, is what, it's not required to issue open badges using CASE uh, as, it, as the internal standard for designating skills and, and courses. But when, when that's done, that triangulation for the purpose of transfer of credit and prior learning uh, evaluation, et cetera, um, is made that much more efficient. So, uh, you know, that's great. You mentioned pocket, you mentioned, the pocket team, Timothy, maybe you could, uh, you know, what is pocket and, and uh, tell us about it. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, so pocket is a digital wallet and portfolio that we're developing uh, here at Arizona State University. Um, my team and I have been uh, building this, uh, this uh, working on this initiative for a couple of years. It's been incredibly exciting. 
gotten to work with a number of really amazing folks like Marty and Brent in a number of different capacities. And um, we really took a, a, a different approach to it by putting the learner right at the center of it. Um, and then thinking about it from the beginning as being sort of a, a multi-sided ecosystem of institutions, employers, and, and really a lot of other types of feeders that may you know, end up being a part of this, this thing that we're all building together. Um, interoperability is something that uh, we've been really uh, working on. Marty and I are, are in a, an interoperability plug fest right together right now. And you know, so we kind of see each other crossing paths there. Um, so there, there's a number of things uh, in that space, but particularly Pocket is meant to be a tool that a learner, any kind of learner, whether they've been learning for years or they're starting brand new, uh, or, or perhaps maybe they're just starting their journey all over again as an adult, it doesn't matter. Um, and we see Pocket as being a tool to really sort of assist them along the way with being able to represent their journey, but, but being most importantly, being able to have one place one sheet of music where they can actually uh, showcase all of their achievements. And I think the, the, the best thing that we've heard so far from the learners has been that, you know, they've said to us, hey, when we use technology like this, it, it kind of, it's kind of like owning the masters to my music. And we find that being incredibly powerful. Um, I know probably, I know everyone on this, on this panel feels that, that way about the tech. So, uh, so that's, that's Pocket in a nutshell. And thank you so much for asking. So it's a confidence builder is what I'm understanding from all the feedback that learners view it as an in, invaluable way to help reinforce the fact that they have accrued so much knowledge and skills that sometimes, yeah. you know, you, we can lose track of that. And so it's a great way to bring that all together into one very useful place. Mark, if I, if I could give you one real use case that uh, really just touched me, um, just happened this weekend. My wife and I were, were at our home uh, doing some work. A gentleman knocked on my door and he started explaining his story. He's selling uh, solar. I know everyone's probably got people knocking on the door selling solar. And the gentleman shared his story. And uh, there was a trainer with him and she was helping and, and coaching and training him. And she said, you know, a year of him doing this is equivalent to about a four-year communications degree. And I just stopped and I, I told him, I said, hey, this is what I'm working on. What do you think about this? I'd love your perspective. And he said, oh my gosh, to have something like that and, and I can represent this, the knocking on doors I'm doing and the interpersonal skills and the, the being able to capture this stuff and, 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 and evolve my life and be the kind of person I want to be for my children. The guy and I talked for about half an hour. I mean, it was amazing to even hear how powerful that was for him. So it's it's a real true uh, use case with real value. That's that's terrific. Uh, Plugfest. Uh, you talk about Marty. Uh, Timothy was referring to Plugfest. Tell tell us more about uh, what's going on there. So I'm sure many have heard about Plugfests uh, of different types. So what what Jobs for the Future and the VC Edu uh, team at W3C and Open Badge 3.0 have all kind of come together. You know, we talk about interoperability, which is, you know, conceptually, I can interact, I can exchange credentials with another system and that system can consume those. Um, you know, interoperability is the idea. Then you have kind of portability, which means that I can actually package up a thing in a, in a way that it is interoperable, that I can send it somewhere. And then there's actually the exchange of that credential. And so the plug fest is actually exchanging credentials between different players in the marketplace. So plug fest one had 21 different, uh, different wallet providers in the space. Uh, and, and they videoed consuming an open uh, OB3 uh, credential. Um, so it was, it was very early in the OB3 development, but, but well aligned with, with where OB3 has ended up and then displaying that credential in their wallet. So very, very first step of, okay, this is what it looks like when I get a credential from another system, that's not me. Because as wallet and providers and issuers, we're all very good at talking to ourselves. Um, and calling it different systems, right? So I've definitely heard a few authoritative systems out there. Once upon a time, many years ago, a very large company, I was talking to them about data quality and data exchange. And they said, well, our data is perfect. You know, it's 100% perfect. And I said, well, why is that? And they said, well, it never leaves our system. Uh, so, 
So now we're getting into the next phase of that where real world exchange is occurring. So Plugfest one was, here's a badge, show us that you can put it in your wallet. Plugfest two is now, hey, get a cohort of, of different wallet providers and actually really exchange this credential between your issuing platform and another system's wallet. Seems very simple and straightforward, but it's actually quite complex because now you're actually applying the rules around interoperability, you're applying the rules around standards. And what, is that, what does that really look like? Well, it's messy. And, and so being willing to throw some spaghetti at the wall and get hit by that spaghetti in the process uh, you know, is a, is a big part of this. And being willing to do that, I think, is, is really moving the market in a new direction that actually is having real world implications of, all right, now there's actually 21, 30, 40 different providers, issuers, consumers that can exchange credentials in a real way. And I can then, you know, actually interpret what that credential means in my system. So I'm not just depending on that source system to interpret the credential. I'm not calling home. It is completely portable. So it's a it's it's a game changer. And, and having independent parties collaborating with W3C, with OneEdTech, with JFF, all of these different parties kind of bringing this community together, we're, we're, we're bridging silos in my mind that haven't been bridged in a long time. And we're very proud here at OneEdTech to provide the certification services, which are used to do the early testing and validation that a particular product's formation of their open badge or their comprehensive learner record is in fact compliant with the spec. And we, we issue actually a seal that uh, that provider can use to take into the market as uh, proof that they are in fact interoperable. Um, and, and, then, and, you know, that's one of the very important things that we do, we provide here at One EdTech as part of that overall ecosystem role. In addition to obviously hosting the, the formation of the specs themselves. That's, uh, that's super and very, very valuable. As a matter of fact, I know Kelly mentioned the upcoming Digital Credentials Summit. We're going to be having some uh, PlugFest participants there at the summit to be able to share more about their experience and hopefully show us a little bit about their product. So uh, in addition uh, uh, to that. So thanks so much for that, Marty. And thank you for uh, your leadership here mm -hmm. in One Ed Tech, as, as well as you, Brent and Timothy, your team's engagement has been awesome. Yeah, the, uh, so the work that Timothy and Marty are doing right now is so important. And for me, what resonates with me is the underlying why and how that represents a paradigm shift, especially for higher education institutions that used to silo this stuff. When I graduated from, when I got my bachelor's degree in the nineties, if I applied for a job, I applied for many, um, I would have to, and I needed to provide evidence of my academic achievements. Well, I'm talking to five different registrar's departments and getting five official uh, academic transcripts to send to that employer to represent myself because it was all landlocked and it created friction for me as a job seeker. So this new world, it does require trust and courage, like Marty said, um, uh, for academic institutions to uh, provide and issue digital credentials that we know are going to be flowing into systems that are not institution focused. They're learner centric and they will have an aggregation and a variety of achievements represented from any number of issuers so that learners could, again, curate those achievements into meaningful collections and possibly share them across learning and employment record type solutions and achievement wallets across this e forming ecosystem, potentially in the form of comprehensive learner record based publishing and consumption. So I think that's one of the beautiful underlying whys of this whole thing is that we're making things more reasonable and appealing and thoughtful for talent to best represent their achievements holistically and for hiring managers and employers to best find them without having to um, perform a lot of redundant tasks around any given individual. So the, the why really resonates me and fuels me in this effort. So thank you both. Yeah, that, that is so well said. Um, you know, the advent of these credential wallets that now are going to be uh, in con controlled by the individual, not by the platform, um, so that people can, in fact, uh, have 
greater influence over the, the use of their credentials and not have to rely on uh, uh, commercial providers, you know, permission to be able to share something. I mean, it's, it's really a, a major uh, shift in, in a uh, way of looking at, at things. So uh, we have, we have some time left. I, I did want to ask each of you, and uh, now that we're talking about uh, credential wallets to, um, to weigh in on what you see as the future of these credential wallets and how the build on building on what Brent was just referring to, um, what do you see as the transformation that might be made possible through these wallets? And uh, how, how do you predict maybe, let's say five years from now, um, things will perhaps be different through the use of the, of the work that you all are involved with now? Feel free to just jump in, whoever wants to go first. Well, I'll, I'll jump in from, from our work around, around the teacher uh, life cycle. Um, so we work at state level with state licensing uh, systems and kind of the entire teacher workflow. But I think when we think about teacher shortage and we think about, you know, how do you build the pipeline? And there's a lot of work going around, uh, going on around apprenticeships and teaching. There's a lot of, you know, bringing more uh, pipeline into the existing workforce. There's alternative credentialing systems, but connecting, programmatically connecting the open positions with candidates on the path to land in those positions where you have a, 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 a body like a licensing board that has to credential these people. These credentials have to be valid when we place them in the classroom. We can now directly connect those systems where you have really, you know, a three, six month placement process when you're actually giving a teacher a license, or you're finding a place for them to land, and then where, where they actually end up teaching the classroom. We can streamline that end to end with this verifiable credential architecture. So we take that three to six month timeline, we shorten that to a month. And so then you're getting new candidates in the, in the pool and available for the classroom, you know, at the beginning of the summer and getting them in the classroom, you know, in the fall. So, so that's a direct real world use case, but before leveraging this type of credential, you really had a three to six month process. Once I get to the licensing system, then all the data must be verified by hand manually. Then whenever the district goes to hire me, all those credentials must be verified by hand, manually. I have to have a background check, I have to have this. Now I can bring all of that together, one streamlined process. Um, so it's really exciting in our world and, and hopefully really make a real impact on, on solving the teacher shortage from a, from a candidate mapping standpoint. Wow. Timothy, any further thoughts on digital wallets? Yeah. Future, you know, five years out, let's say. For sure. Uh, you know, for me, the future of digital wallets lies in their ability to act as a verifiable credential ecosystem. Um, this would allow users to do a multitude of things, uh, not only just sharing their VCs, but also in terms of grounding and managing their digital identity. Um, in order to do that, you know, some of the things we alluded to around interoperability, you know, uh, that Marty alluded to um, being open, there being an open API, maybe even for some of these things. But I think there needs to be a, a lot of tools and development being built. But I think that when we get toward this ecosystem, what we're talking about, um, you know, verifiable credentials will probably end up being a really important means of storing value and transacting things, especially around this data that we're talking about. And I think that this shift is going to be incredibly massive and profound um, on the industry. You know, just even if you think about, um, it, actually, I, I would actually say that I think this technology could uh, help lead us to real social inclusion uh, by empowering those who don't have easily recognizable forms of identification or easy, easily recognizable uh, credentials, maybe. Um, so just even at that level, uh, considering where we are in our human evolution and human development right now, um, bringing more of that talent and those skill sets and those kinds of folks like the gentleman who stopped and knocked on my door this weekend 
to, to be able to bring the value to bear of their knowledge, I think that's where, what the future is. I think that is our future. And I think we're sitting at the, at the precipice of this technology really fueling uh, this really valuable and massive future. So very exciting. Brent, last word. Uh, I, in five years, I see an ecosystem, we're using the word ecosystem a lot, and I think it's really important that uh, at least I, I constantly remind myself there's not just one achievement wallet, there's not just one learning and employment record, this is going to be a broad ecosystem, graduates from my institution might want to be represented in any number of those, so for uh, from our perspective, our goal is going to be about the learner experience, the student experience of engaging with that and not having to perform a dozen redundant tasks and a dozen redundant wallets to best represent present themselves in certain states and in certain industries and in certain industries and in certain states, government sectors, nationally, that type of thing. So I think the five-year solve is interoperability across those consuming systems. And again, I think comprehensive learner record is definitely an aspect of that solve. And the other thing is ultimately this is um, about employment data as well, and also feeding this information into the places where hiring managers and employers are looking for talent. Often their talent search systems, their HRIS, Oracle Workday, all that fun stuff that they use. The more convenient we could make this for hiring managers to actually discover talent by passing this verifiable and self-asserted achievement data into the systems that they're already using, the more elegant our solve. And five years would be wonderful. It's aggressive. Well, so far we've been wor working at, at uh, warp speed, so I'm mm -hmm. optimistic. And uh, I wanted to thank each of you for sharing your knowledge and experience with our our participants, our, our attendees today. So we really appreciate it. And Kelly, thank you for organizing the group. Uh, if there are any questions, I think we have a few minutes. Um, so if, you, if anyone on a call would like to pose a question to one of these experts, please do. Yeah, feel free to enter your question in the chat, or if you'd like, you can um, unmute yourself and ask it orally um, to this group. They're, they're ready on, on the hot seat for any question you might have for them. While we're pausing for that, I'll just remind you that this was recorded, so I will follow up later this week with a copy of the recording for you. Our next Digital Credentials Roundtable is scheduled for October 24th, um, and we'll be talking about um, digital badge taxonomies or frameworks for how institutions are um, going to be laying that out. WGU will be joining us, not Brent, but one of his colleagues, as well as a couple of other institutions will be sharing their um, stories about how they've been doing that. Any questions? You guys are experts. You've left them without any questions at all. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you, Kelly. And take care, everyone. Thank you. Have a